Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everyone everyone along the way. <laughs> no, that sounds gossipy. We talk about everything along the way. I am Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger. Brian Broom has apparently been kidnapped by gnomes. We'll let you know if he's safe as soon as we find out. We are talking today about Elijah once again. It's been a while since we recorded, actually. So uh, you want to recap what we talked about last week? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, actually, the last couple of times, in case people have missed it. So we have this new king on the throne named Ahab, and he marries a Phoenician wife who was a daughter of a priest of Baal. Her name is Jezebel. And they decide that introducing Baal worship into Israelite culture is a good thing as a state-sponsored exclusive religion. And Jezebel sets about killing all the prophets of the Lord. Uh, God responds by sending drought, no rain. But first, Elijah, the prophet, comes out of nowhere and says, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be rain until I say so. And then vanishes, and apparently no one thinks anything about it, until years go by, one year, two years, three years, and suddenly there, there's still no rain. And everything's turning brown, and the animals are dying, and people are, need water, and it's really bad. And so Ahab's looking all over for Elijah. He happens to be hanging out in Phoenician territory. That's another story that we kind of passed over, where God cares for him by the hand of a Gentile woman. Something that Jesus makes much of later that on. That Jesus makes much of. There were many widows in Israel, but God did not send Elijah to any of them. In other words, when God's people are faithless, God will turn to the Gentiles to provoke his people to jealousy, and save the Gentiles and save Israel, a pattern we see throughout Scripture. Anyhow, so um, Ahab and his steward, Obadiah, go out to find water, apparently secretly, she suggested, because they're alone. And you don't, maybe you don't want to give away the fact that your, all your war machines about to die. The horses have no water. And Obadiah comes in, to, runs into Elijah, who says, go show Ahab that I'm here. And after throwing a bit of a fit of, you're going to vanish and that'll cost me my head because he's looking for you everywhere. Elijah calms him down and Ahab comes. And that's about where we're picking it up. God has sent Elijah back to confront Ahab. And the strategy is a contest, a war of the gods. Uh, and Elijah dictates the terms. He says, gather everyone to Mount Carmel, which is uh, in Southern Phoenician territory. Uh, it's a high place. It means it's up near the skies and the clouds where lightning strikes are common. And it's theoretically Baal's territory because Baal is, uh, Baal is the um, god of storms. Although he's been kind of inactive for the last three years. <laughs> but let's give him a court advantage. And you gather all the prophets because you've got a lot of them. Uh, 450 prophets of Baal and prophets of the groves of Asherah, the female side, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. These are state-sponsored false prophets. You're going to gather them there, and we're going to have a contest. Interestingly enough, Ahab agrees. Ahab is somewhat pliable and kind of responds to the strongest will in his face at the time. Usually it's his wife, but when Elijah tells him to do things, he generally does, because... He's weak. And so uh, uh, Ahab summons all of Israel, or presumably their representatives, to come and um, meet at Mount Carmel. And this is where the story picks up. Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If Yahweh be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Ah, smart. <laughs> Don't be noncommittal. Let's not get our, our our words in the paper or anything. If anyone's photographing us, so not will not stand out. Let's see what happens. Then said Elijah to the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord. Well, Obadiah had just told him that he's hidden a hundred prophets in caves and fed them with water from Jezebel's table. It's not clear whether Elijah just kind of miss that or whether he's just speaking in terms of as far as you know. But anyway, right now he's the only one there. So he's the only only representative. 
But Isn't Bales? he betraying the truth by not saying, aha, there are more of <laughs> Yeah, but us. there are more of us in hiding, waha. Yeah, <laughs> some people would think so, I'm sure. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let us give, let them therefore give us, you, know, you give us, two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves. You, you get first go at it, you false prophets. Cut it in pieces, that is, prepare for sacrifice, lay it on wood, and put no fire under it, and I'll dress the other. And lay it on wood, and put no fire under it. And call you on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of Yahweh. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. Now, he's not saying that your vote will bring God into existence. He's talking about covenant commitment. Pick whom you're going to serve. you got to serve somebody. It may be the devil. It may be the Lord. But <laughs> pick somebody, and let's make Thanks, this... Bob Dylan. Yeah. Let's make this official and clear pick a side and stay there. And here's the test, uh, which God is able to send fire from heaven? It's Baal's specialty, so that, we're on a mountaintop near the clouds, give you that, Phoenician territory, it's Baal's backyard. Uh, you can't say, well, he's not the God of this particular region. It sure is. And you, there's a whole lot more of you than me. So if, if sheer numbers count with God or the gods, that should win the day for you right there. But you're going to get the sacrifice all set up, but you're not going to light it with fire, watching for any of those instant burn sticks under there. <laughs> and um, they, the people say, all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. They like a show. They like a circus. They like a contest. They like religious hype. So this sounds good to them. It's a, it'll be an entertaining day. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose you one bullock for yourselves for, and dress it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under it. And they took a bullock, which was given them, and dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon. So that's probably about three hours. Saying, O oh, Baal, hear us. Apparently that was all they said all day. Maybe they threw in... Baal, hear us, hear us, Baal, oh, hear us, Baal, 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 Baal. But, you know, there's the, there, there was not, this is not an attempt to persuade with logical arguments, to offer covenant reasons why Baal should act. It is simply, honestly, to be as annoying as anything. <laughs> there is a, a story uh, that comes out of Egypt, out of their legends or mythology, of a man who wanted the gods to do something, so he went up on a mountaintop and threatened the gods with all kinds of horrible things he would do to them if they didn't answer. And the gods were so frightened by his speech that they gave in. That is pretty much the pagan attitude. Mm -hmm. God can be manipulated, frightened, cowed, enticed. Now, that's the point of sacrifices. Feed the gods, give them a good dinner out, and um, they'll do all kinds of things for you. Because there is no love relationship here. And we'll come back and talk about the whole priest of Baal thing in a minute. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And we'll talk about that some more, too. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. They're jumping up and down, and jumping toward the altar, over the altar, Jack be nimble, Jack be quick. And it came to pass at noon, so Elijah's watched this for a few hours. He's getting bored. And he decides, this is a good time for mocking. <laughs> now, that's something else that we're never supposed to do with other religions, right? Never mm. mock them. Elijah does. Some may say, well, this was a slip in his spirituality. No, this was calling foolishness foolishness. This is a completely appropriate under these circumstances. Now, you wouldn't say this to the sweet old lady who's conducting you through the Mormon tabernacle and showing you the organ. He's um, not just being rude here yeah. to be rude. No. He is making a public point before a big audience. This is not a private thing. This is not an insult. He is trying to get the people to see how ridiculous this all is. Here are the things that Elijah says, at least as they come across in the uh, authorized version. Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he's talking, or he's pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awaked. You've anthropomorphized this god, as the pagans generally did. So doesn't that bring with it the same limitations that a human being would have? Uh, maybe he's asleep and you need to wake him up. Maybe he's on a phone call. Maybe he's on a journey. 
the, pursuing, uh, I think this is the part where some of the translations say turned aside in a pursuit or something. What it means is he's turned aside to use the, the bathroom. You know, and again, it's not some hunting. People, no, some people are are going to be offended. He talked about a bathroom in the Bible. Yeah. He, oh, yes, no. He, yeah. God doesn't and, know about bathrooms. And accused a pagan god of someone else's religion. He talks about their god going to the bathroom. Yep, sure did. Uh, he is mocking them because it is mock worthy. And again, this is not a private little jab fest. This is before all Israel and all their rulers looking on. And he is making the point that this religion is ridiculous, and it ought to be laughed at. Brian is back. Hey, the gnomes Jesus. have released him. There was a harrowing uh, rescue attempt by a private security team somewhere in Malta. Don't ask me <laughs> how the gnomes made it to Malta. But here I am. <laughs> Glad you found rapid transport at hypersonic speed to get you back in time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, me too. So um, we are in 1 Kings 18. And Elijah is currently mocking the prophets of Baal, and now they, urged on by his mocking, decide to up the ante themselves. They cried aloud, this is verse 28, they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner. This was not something they invented for this occasion. This is what they really normally did. They cut themselves with knives and let sets till the blood gushed out upon them. There is a reference in Leviticus to making cuttings and markings in your skin for the dead. And this is almost certainly the original pattern of what was going on. There's some one parallel in scripture. It's a magical process. If you can terrify the gods, if you can do something that is so anti-natural that nature itself is revulsed, then you may get what you want. And it is no accident in our time that uh, cutting has become such a way of protesting one's very existence protesting the nature of reality and saying, look at me, I'm suffering, I want out. It's, so it's not about tattoos? It's not, not really, no. I mean, there may be some distant application, but that's not the primary meaning. Um, There's it's, also an mm -hmm. interesting parallel as well to how the, the this way of trying to get magical influence mm -hmm. uh, against the powers that be. It's very, it's an user's mindset. Yes. You should do what I want or else I will hurt myself. Oh, you're not doing it? Well, I'm hurting myself. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's very good. Yeah, very good observation. That's exactly what's going on. You know, we tend to think of abuse as I hurt you to get what I want, but yes, very often it is exactly that. I will hurt me. Yeah, it's um, manipulative. So it is, absolutely. Yeah. And if you play that game with the with your gods, then what are you going to do with people? Mm. This was a religious system that got people to sacrifice their children. Yeah, that doesn't come cheaply and without a lot of emotional manipulation. Well, they kept doing that and they're bloody all over the place. It came to pass when midday was past and they prophesied until the time of the evening sacrifice. That would be about three o'clock in the afternoon when now we're in Israel, the northern kingdom. The temple is in Judah, the southern kingdom. That's where the temple sacrifices would be going on. But a good part of the theme here is that this kingdom should not be divided. It's been divided because of unbelief and remains divided because of idolatry. And this new idolatry has taken it even further. So uh, God waits, and Elijah waits, until what he's going to do is coincide with the evening sacrifice in the temple, pointing out the continuity of his worship. Normally, Israel was not to erect altars beyond the one that was in the temple of Jerusalem. But here, we're, this is sort of acting as a projection of that altar. It's cell phoned in, as it were, because it's done by God's prophet at God's direction at the same time the other is happening. And it's being done in a very personal, upfront, God's in your face kind of way. And it's actually an old altar. So Elijah, the, there's no voice, nor any that answered, nor any that regarded. We're going to come back to that. And Elijah said unto the people, come near unto me. People came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. So there was a 12 stone altar that was there. Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. Notice again, emphasizing the problem here. It's not so much the national disunity, although that's a side effect. 
but it's a religious disunity. You are one nation covenant together under God. You could exist as a different political entity that we could make that work, but two different religions? No, that's, that's the whole problem here. There's one covenant. You guys are running away from it. Time to end this now. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of Yahweh. And he made a trench around the altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed, pretty big. And he put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, laid them on the wood, and said, fill four barrels of water, and pour it upon the burnt sacrifices and on the wood. He said, do it the second time. And they did it the second time. He said, do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran around the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. That's four times three, that's 12. 12 stones, 12 buckets of water. The water is overwhelming. This is what they need. They need water. They need rain from heaven. But more than that, they need the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. If this thing is going to be put back together, that's their most desperate need. So he's but, wasting all this water. Yeah, <laughs> uh, people, other people have asked, where did the water come from? They're in the middle of a drought. Well, two possible answers. Supposedly, there's a spring at the bottom of Carmel that never, ever runs dry. I don't know. I've just heard that. But the other thing, like uh, the town in California, Carmel was by the sea. Sea. Oh, hey. Yeah. It's there's sea water down there. Yeah. Is that, that where, um, what's his name was, Mayor? Yep. Yeah. Him. Yeah. Clint Eastwood. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful town. Yeah. So the thing is drenched in water. Trench is filled with water. Came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near. And said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. So he's appealing to God as the covenant God of all of these people. And he says, Israel, not Jacob. Because that happens to be the name of this place. Let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel. That's the first point of the covenant. You are the sovereign God here now. Not just in general. No, you're not the God behind God. You're not the holy other God. You're not the transcendent God while local nature deities rule the, the immediate context. You're not the God behind the Newtonian system of mechanics that actually runs things. You are the covenant-keeping God who is in Israel. Second part of the covenant, I'm your servant. That is, I come from the court of heaven with the word of the Lord, and they need to listen to me. And that I have done all these things at thy word. You have spoken a covenant word. This is the third part of the covenant. And I'm obeying you, and they need to obey you. They need to conform to your law. Hear me, O Lord, hear me. That's the one repetition in his prayer, because he's earnest. But he doesn't keep on saying, hear me, Lord, hear me, over and over again. That this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. And that's the fourth point. He's asking for sanctions, positive sanctions. Use this as an opportunity to preach your gospel to them and change their hearts. And he ends because the next step is God's continuity, inheritance. Will God disinherit his people, or will he call them back to himself? And the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. God takes it all into his glory. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, Yahweh, he is the God. Yahweh, he is the God. Which, of course, is what Elijah wanted, a confession that there's only one God and that's Yahweh. Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon, which runs along the bottom, apparently. And so, so apparently there was some water. And slew them there. And if not, the water that's coming is going to take care of the bodies and wash them out to the ocean, all the way out of the promised land. Is not this murder? No, the, the uh, idolatry commanded the death penalty in Israel. They should have been executed. But is he the right man to do it? Yes, he comes from God's right hand. He can do anything <laughs> God tells him to. Uh, Samuel, before you may remember, hewed Agag the king in pieces when he got cocky. Yeah, and this and is so, not just people uh, who believed differently. These were the people no. who were enslaving the people in demon worship. Yeah, these were the state hired demon worship prophets. These were the state-employed public education worship of demon people. Um, it's also, uh, type, typologically speaking, um, you mentioned the, the water even uh, washing their corpses out to sea, yes. which is 
the depths, Sheol, yes. the depths of the earth. It's the same place where Jonah goes in the belly of the fish, and why right. Jonah, as flawed as he is, is a uh, is a Christ figure for one who goes to the depths of Sheol and rises up again. Rises they don't come again. back, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they don't come back. They never came back. Oh. Um, but the cat came back. Yep. Yeah. Very next day. I don't get that reference. Oh, okay. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> oh, is it a reference? I just thought it was a funny statement. <laughs> oh, no, there's there's an old bluegrass song, The Cat Came ah. Back. See, I oh. was going to go to they never, he never returned, he never returned in his oh. fate still unlearned. But, um, <laughs> Poor old Charlie. Um, Elijah said to Ahab, get thee up and eat and drink, for there is the sound of abundance of rain. There's an old gospel hymn. There shall be showers of blessing, sound of abundance of rain over the hills and the mountains. Well, he didn't. This is a statement of faith. They're not hearing anything. Maybe by faith he can actually hear it, but we can't. No one else there could hear it. So Ahab, again, does what he's told. He's very pliable when confronted with a stronger will. And he, his guys just lost big time and they're all dead. So, you know, and all the people seem to be on Elijah's side. So he's telling me to go eat. Okay, I'm going to do that. He goes to eat. And Elijah goes up to the top of Carmel, throws himself on the ground, puts his face between his knees, and um, after he's praying. And after a bit, he says to his servant, go up and look toward the sea. And the servant comes back and says, there's, there's nothing. He said, go again. And he does this seven times. Each time he prays, because God has told him to do all this. Elijah, and we're told in James chapter 5, we looked at this earlier, that it was Elijah's prayers that brought on the rain in the first place. He turned, prayed in terms of God's law, and God withheld rain. But now God has said, go show yourself. So God's ready to send the rain. Elijah understands that. But God's waiting on Elijah's prayers again. God can wait a long time. So Elijah needs to be fervent and diligent in his prayers right now, as James tells us. And so he does. But it doesn't take all that long. Seven, seven intercessions, a fullness of intercession, each time sending the servant, because he's expecting. He doesn't know how long this is going to take, but he figures God wants to do it, so it's not going to take that long. And finally, the servant comes back and says, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea, like a man's hand. In other words, really tiny. He said, Go up, say to Ahab, prepare thy chariot, and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And while Ahab's getting the stuff together, and I'm packing up the, the tents and the banners and all of that, it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins, and he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. There's the story. Uh, next time we'll look at what it means to come down off a mountaintop victory. Mm -hmm. Often it's not that great. We've talked about all of the elements here before, uh, at the risk of, of boring our listeners, I'd like to go through them again. The original article contained a quote from the Berenstain Bears Nature Guide, <laughs> <laughs> just to show you how far down and how delicately this comes to us. Nature is one, I think the little girl bear asked, what's nature? And she's told, nature is all that is, or was, or ever will be. Which happens to be a quote from Carl Sagan in his program, The Cosmos. The cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. Now, the thing is, materialists and pantheists can both agree on this. Mm -hmm. For the materialist, the whole universe, nature, is matter. Matter in motion. Uh, the in the void. I mean, those are the three things you need. For the pantheist, all things are spirit, whatever spirit is. And when you have no transcendental reference point, it's hard to explain exactly what the difference is. And so in the 20th century, we began to see an awful lot of physicists winding their way toward Hinduism and, and Eastern philosophies of that sort. Because quantum mechanics was beginning to give the appearance of a basic irrationality and a oneness of all things that they could not explain. And rather than try a more classical approach or some other alternate explanation, they kind of were throwing in the towel and saying, well, you know, it just sounds a lot like Hinduism where everything's one and 
Everything, not everything has an explanation. It just kind of bubbles up out of some original reality and there you are. So when, when we're looking at this kind of nature worship, it's very modern, but it's also very ancient. It's the, it's the universal faith of the ancient world. It is, it is ultimately humanistic, man-centered. It is anti-theistic. So let, let's, let's run. Th let, me, let me go off on a, 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 a side thing here to make this perhaps a little clearer. Uh, as good Christians living in the West, we hear deism, pantheism, atheism, uh, Christian theism, polytheism, and there's one or two others that aren't as common. And we say, oh, this means you have one God, many gods, all is God, uh, no God. And we naively assume that the word God means the same <laughs> thing for each one. Hmm. Yeah, it doesn't, mm, does it? It doesn't remotely, <laughs> no. And, and, but, well, you know, everybody has a God. Everybody has something that you may call God because there's no other available word. Even God speaks of the idols as gods. He speaks of the devil as a God after a fashion. He speaks of human judges as gods and angels as gods. That doesn't mean a whole lot. When you, when people, what people tend to think in America is, well, we all worship the same God. So uh, the Jehovah of the Jews, uh, the Trinitarian God of Scripture, Allah, Brahma, um, these are all the same God looked at from different angles. The same kind of God. A God, you know, it's, it's one God who comes in varieties. You want the blue one or the green one. You want the cheap one or the expensive one. You want the, want the one with powers cheering or whatnot. But, it's, but God is God. Um, we need to understand this is not remotely ca the case. Mm. When Satan in paradise said, you shall be as gods knowing good and evil, he was not suggesting for a moment that they could be creators. He had already said there's no creator. By saying, you shall not surely die, he was saying, no one is sovereign, no one rules the world. No, therefore, no one made the world. The world is self-existent, self-sustaining. There are just many powers within the world. Call them gods if you like, if it makes you feel good. What he offered them was not even phenomenal cosmic power. It was simply <laughs> the power to decide right and wrong for yourself and impose it on other people. In a word, Phariseeism. Which is which is Satanism, which is, you know, it's all the same thing. And that's the point. It is all the same thing. When we get to the New Testament, we see Phariseeism, we often think, oh, well, this is a brand new kind of evil. No, it's the original evil. And uh, and therefore, it is of greatest danger to the churches. It's in the churches that you may find the things that are most truly satanic, because people set themselves up as gods, making up their own rules and judging other people in terms of them. And because the rules look nice and clean and squeaky, we don't suspect for a moment that the mere fact of making them and imposing them is a satanic act. And we do not see how far this is from the gospel of Christ. Mm. Paul saw, and John at the end of talking about trying to invent different kinds of Christ says, keep yourselves from idols. These theological departures from the gospel is idolatry and it is Satanism. So, you know, we, we get all afraid of for instance, there are a lot of families in our school who come out of a tradition where Halloween is really, really evil and scary, and they can't understand why anyone would celebrate it. You don't want to celebrate. That's fine. That's your business. But I, I, I can guarantee in all my years trick-or-treating as a child, I was never confronted with Satan. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I even had my candy stolen. There were some weird people wandering around, but usually they were superheroes and princesses and things like that. In the churches... I know a local church that I have unfortunately some connections with where the gospel that's preached is a gospel of faith plus covenant faithfulness, good works. Uh. Uh, yeah, this is a damning gospel and it grieves me very much because I know people there and love them, but that's far more satanic than celebrating mm -hmm. Halloween. I'm sorry. We need to get our priorities straight. Anyhow, so in the ancient world, in, in scripture particularly, we see this thing called Baal worship. Now, first of all, there was no God named Baal. Baal is a title. It's, it's equivalent of calling them gods. It means Lord. Every city had its Lord, its God. It usually uh, represented some distant ancestor who has died and been buried at the heart of the city and deified and you build your magic walls around him and everybody who worships that God belongs to that community. Um, and to be a member of that community, you have to worship that God. But that God has now been absorbed into the forces of nature and rules alongside of them um, and has taken up a role 
representing the forces of nature. He is now, represents, is a stand-in for the sun, the lightning, the rain, the winds, the violent masculine side of nature. The feminine side, uh, Asherah, Ashtaroth, Astarte, um, Isis in Egypt, uh, Aphrodite in Greece, is the, or Gaia, is the feminine side, it's Mother Earth, the fertility of the human womb, of the land, the crops, the animals, all of that. So when the male gets it on with the female and does it right, then prosperity happens for everybody. It then becomes the king's job to oversee this process and make sure that the gods are being honored in such a way, the forces of nature are being honored in such a way, that this happens. And if the king is doing his job as a cosmic social engineer, a magical social engineer, then the city, the community, the nation prospers. If he fails to do his job, well, then he's up for assassination because we need someone else. But as long as he's doing his job, don't mess with him. If he tells you jump, you say how high. It is a status religion because although the, the king was not considered a god, he was considered the king, the god's right-hand man here on earth. And he does on earth what the gods do in the heavens, uh, what the forces of nature do. So these gods are forces of nature. They were anthropomorphized, that is, they were spoken of as if they were human, but that's not the point. They are impersonal forces. So in Baalism, it is atheistic. There is no creator god. It is humanistic. Man can boss the gods around. It is magical. Man can boss the gods around. It is polytheistic. This god has many manifestations, and yet at bottom, all reality is one, so it's pantheistic or materialistic, one of the two. Um, all is one, one is all. So that's what we're dealing with here. And because of this, there's never a thought of loving Baal, having an intimate relationship with Baal. Welcoming Baal into your heart. Yeah. Um, none of this. Basically, you want to keep Baal at bay or you want to bribe him. Magic is for, for pushing him off, sacrifices and for inviting his favors. As I said earlier, take him out to dinner, buy him a good lunch, and maybe he'll do something nice for you. Failing that, try to intimidate him. And how do you intimidate nature? By doing that which is anti-natural. So cutting yourself, sacrificing your firstborn child, ritual prostitution is actually... Not not intimidating, but homosexual prostitution can be, because that's anti-nature. So you begin to do all of these things to provoke nature to do your thing. It is magical, and yet it is thoroughly materialistic in the sense that there is no personal being involved here, except there was. And sometimes they got a hint of that. And that's why, coming back to the final resolution, it is so important that Scripture says that there was neither voice, nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. And the first response is, well, of course not, because Baal's not real. Yes, but Deuteronomy, Psalms, Paul, all tell us that the things that the Gentiles sacrificed, they sacrificed to demons. There were real spiritual dark forces behind these things. Mm -hmm. To what degree and how that worked, we're not told, nor do we need to know. But Demons did pop in and out and do little nifties for these people to awe them, to frighten them, to hold them in terror. And the demons were apparently used to occasionally popping in and making prophecies or responding. And what this is saying is that on this occasion, however badly they wanted to intervene, God had shut their mouths. They were not around. They were kicked out. They were muzzled. They could not do one thing. Not only was Elijah winning the battle on this side of the invisible wall, God and his <laughs> angels were rounding up demons and kicking them out on the other side. And so there's no one there. The, the, the prophets who are used to that occasional voice, it's not there all of a sudden. Mm. Sometimes perhaps the voice in their head, it's suddenly gone silent. No one's at, no one's at home. No one's on the line. No one's picking up. Uh, do, do, do. Uh, <laughs> this number is no longer in service. <laughs> Nobody's knocking on the table. Yes, there are no knocks on the table. No one's moving the planchette on the Ouija board. It's just not happening. In contrast to what the Baal prophets were doing, which was trying to provoke God, frighten God, entice God, manipulate God, Elijah simply comes forward, recognizes the covenant order that God himself has set up, 
He's submitting to and remember, David got in trouble with moving the ark because we did we sought him not according to the due order. Elijah is not violating that order. He has permission to use this altar. It is a traditional altar. It's an altar of 12 stones. He's doing a traditional peace offering. And it's all right with God because God's going to show it's all right because God's going to light the fire himself. Elijah isn't. He's not setting. This is not will worship. He does not step forward and say, ha, look, a big lighter. It starts. He <laughs> waits for God. And to get God to answer, he simply talks to him. There's no ranting and raving. There's no threatening. There's no vain repetitions that our Lord speaks of. Uh, he just talks to him as a man talks to his friend. Humbly, yeah. passionately, he does slip in one, one repetition, but no more. And there is a logic to his prayers. It's a logic of covenant thinking. And it's a very short prayer. And when he's done, fire falls, obliterates everything, and he gets the response. And then God, who has shut up the heavens so that Baal can't do anything, now opens them. And responds to human prayer, conversation with God, words from man to God about specific things in time and space on earth. Intelligible speech. Intelligible speech. God honors this by sending rain that was not on the horizon before. It comes quickly. It comes out of nowhere. And this is, and we've talked about this, is the very kind of prayer that God commends to us. Just because it looks impossible, maybe is impossible by the reckoning of Newtonian mechanics, doesn't mean you can't pray for it. And it doesn't mean that God can't answer because he set up rules he can't break. God can do whatever he wants. And although he does not do, we've talked about this, doesn't do sign miracles, scripture's complete. He can do anything he wants to, uh, through means, beyond means, without means, I believe is more or less how the Westminster Confession phrases it. And it uses the present tense, not he could, he still can, and sometimes still does. And then sometimes it doesn't, he doesn't have to. There's the answers lying there right in front of us and we just miss it and suddenly we see it. But he can, when he wants to, be very impressive and kind of um, do what the Puritans would call special providences. And that's what he does here. He pulls rain out of seemingly nowhere. Well, maybe it was over there just beyond the horizon. Maybe it wasn't, but it comes. It falls. It soaks the land. And, and God empowers Elijah through the Holy Spirit to run faster than a chariot. Mm -hmm. So first superhero, super speed. Um, <laughs> And so if you're in Nazarite, do you get like Samson super had super strength yeah. and Elijah had super speed. So you just are super if you're in Nazarite. Uh, and Elisha has, I think it's Elisha has super vision because he can see into alternate room. Anyway, we're being <laughs> Um Run a bit far. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the people all applaud. And mm. this is what we talk about next time, I believe. What did this actually accomplish? The people said they believed. They voted right for one election. They voted God in as king this time. But what happens when Jezebel hears, and um, what's that going to look like? And that waits for next time. I, I think I want to read the conclusion I originally wrote. Okay. If the truth of religion is a matter of personal opinion, then religion is culturally irrelevant. Mm -hmm. But if God is real, his reality has social, political, and legal implications. The kingdom of God matters on earth and in history. And this the unbeliever finds intolerable. You may keep your God in your private thoughts, he tells us, but don't you dare bring him and his absolute world out into the public square. We won't tolerate such bigotry, ignorance, and hatred. The worship of nature is another matter, of course, because in worshiping nature, man worships himself. And who in his right mind could object to that? Bum -bum. Closing thoughts? illustrations that you see around you? Yeah, I was noticing this kind of thinking even on the Babylon Beat podcast today as I was <laughs> listening. They had a guest on who's running for office in Southern California, also an actor. I can't recall his name at the moment, but they they talked about saying the Lord's Prayer when you have the sleep paralysis demon in, in yeah. The sleep paralysis demon. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. so so it's like when you have a sleep disorder or a depression, apparently it's a very common thing to see like an old hag at the foot of your bed. Oh, um, yeah. That's an old tradition. I've heard that before. Yeah. Um, and so the the guest on the show is like, oh, yeah, you start saying the Lord's Prayer, it goes right away. It works every time. 
And the guy was like, well, I'm not Catholic. And <laughs> the guy's like, oh, it doesn't matter. You just say it. And it goes away. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's how that works, huh? Sure. <laughs> Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. I didn't. Yeah. Didn't know it was so easy to remove, um, to do white magic on the uh, demons. Yeah. In the name of Jesus. Mm. <laughs> Brian, you don't have anything for us along these lines? Not really. It's, it's kind of like you, you, you took everything that I would have thought of eventually and said it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, That's very don't. efficient. <laughs> yeah. I mean, hey. Um, but yeah, it's when, when it comes down to it, we need to remember that prayer is something that God uses as a means. It, mm -hmm. It's not magical. I mean, when I was growing up, now I don't. I don't want to uh, make the claim that my parents believe this, but other people in in that general word of faith tradition essentially treated prayer as okay. This is how I do my part in an in spiritual battle because mm -hmm. uh, without me, nothing's going to happen. Right. And it it does end up with a very um, a worldview that's very magical yeah. because, well, you know, Satan has his warriors out in the world, and they're all all the godless heathens out there that that hate hate the church and hate God, and that's true to a certain extent, of course. But then we're the warriors that go out, and it's our prayers, it's our uh, declaring things, it's our will uh -huh. that wins the day essentially and god's just the the um the battery that yeah. you know powers our laser rifle uh <laughs> spiritual laser rifle so we don't i don't like that <laughs> um, do, do not uh, endorse do, do not endorse remember that. the christian novel uh this present darkness i was actually just about to mention that next yes can you tell us about uh, it so uh, Emily, I don't know if you're familiar with the the um, name Frank Peretti. I have heard that name. I have yes. not read any of his books. He he wrote this book called This Present Darkness, and it's basically a it's a novelization, a dramatization of spiritual warfare in the modern day, which uh, for him was 1987, 88, something like that, when the book was written. And it's like the see it's been so long since i've even read it but i think it's like the action is like oh there's this evil cabal and yes. they are being influenced by demons or you know knowingly working with demons and they're they're democrats or they're <laughs> um public school teachers or mm. uh public school administrators or something like that and they're they're out to to do evil nefarious things, and they they sit with their their backs in large executive recliners with their fingers steepled. Um, <laughs> and the narrative action is people praying, and then angels get like power ups essentially, yep. oh, and wow. they fight the demons because now they've been uh, empowered by prayer and. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of problems with this. We can't do anything until God's people pray. Yeah, yeah. I didn't fully recognize it for what it was at the time, but looking back on it now, it's like, yeah, that's white magic. Yeah, um, which is to say, magic, which is to say, wrong. That's yep. you get, God does not. God uses our prayers most certainly, but it is the Spirit who moves us to pray in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, all godly prayer is prompted by the Holy Spirit, but God wants. Uh, there's a line in, uh, in Narnia. Doesn't doesn't Aslan already know? Yes, but sometimes he likes to be asked. <laughs> and God, God wants to commune with His people. Mm. He wants us to ask, and when we ask, He may be inclined to move more quickly or in a new direction. Not because he hadn't thought of it, it's a new idea, we're in energizing him somehow, but because he wants to commune with us. And that's why it's important when we look at what Elijah does. It is Prayer is not a ranting and raving. It is simply a conversation with God, mm -hmm. presenting an intelligible language, mm -hmm. intelligent, logical reasons based on covenant, based upon God's prior revelation of himself. And based on his character. Which are in turn is based yeah. on his character, yeah. So that's that's the nature of prayer over against magic. 
prayer is not Christian magic. It is magic of all sorts, if it's true magic. It's satanic. It is either a calling on demons or at least an opportunity for demons to poke their heads in. It is an attempt to, to manipulate heaven or mm -hmm. hell or something. And it's fraught with all kinds of dangers, whether it's white or black. I am suddenly reminded of the, the story of the, of the schoolboy who needs help in his geometry, so he decides to summon a demon. <laughs> <laughs> so he draws the, uh, the protecting uh, pentagram and summons up the demon, and he shakingly, with shaking voice, says to the demon, I need a little help with my geometry. And the demon says, yes, you do, as he sp walks into the hexagram. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> the devil's bargain is never a good one. Prayer is not that. It is not a Christianized version of that. It is talking to our Heavenly Father, who happens to be God. And, I, uh, I remember finding out, like, one, one of the founding thinkers, I guess, of the Word of Faith movement mm -hmm. taught that when mankind fell, there's, there's a whole laundry list of things that are wrong with what I'm about to say. Um, one is that God created the, un the universe and then created man as uh, a little God. Mm -hmm. Already at a problem point here. When mankind fell, God lost his connection point for his authority on earth. Oh, good. And it was ceded to Satan instead, who is the God of this world, of course. Right. Because uh, that's what that means. Right. And... The only way that God is able to act in history post-fall is through the will and prayer of people. They are magical conduits, essentially. Um, now, they would never put it in that phraseology, but that's essentially yeah. what they're talking about. And we want to contrast that with what Scripture teaches, is that God is the one who wills. God is the one who sits in the heavens and does mm -hmm. all that he pleases. And it's not just in the heavens that he does all that he pleases. Yeah. Scriptures are full of God taking the first step in history in miraculous steps. Yep. Yeah. Revelation if, comes first. If God the schema acted. of word of faith is correct, then they have to throw out a very large chunk of the Pentateuch alone. Yeah. yeah. Because the angel appearing in the burning bush yeah. <laughs> is God acting yeah. in the earth, and there was no person around. To channel him up. To channel him to Moses. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And actually, uh, going back as well to the um, the thing you mentioned about the church in, in in the area that turns the gospel into faith plus covenant faithfulness. Yes. That's essentially the boiled down version of every false religion is yeah. effort, human effort. Right. And Absolutely. it doesn't matter if you say there's faith first, because yeah. if you stay in by faithfulness, then you're out. You're, you have failed immediately. <laughs> yes. Yes. You are not going to be faithful. Um, uh, and, and, yeah, and only as your works are covered by the blood and righteousness of Christ are they pleasing and acceptable to God. Spiritual sacrifice is acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Yes. Not autonomously, not on their own, not because we've now turned a corner and can do good things. That's Pelagianism or semi-Pelagianism, yeah. not that there's any huge difference there. Um, and, and yes, it again is essentially magical. Without the magic, it's not even fun. It's just, <laughs> it's a legalistic, really, it's Phariseeism. You know, paganism in the well, ancient world was a lot more even... exciting than Phariseeism ever was. That's... But then it was the Pharisees and Sadducees who crucified Christ, not the black mages. So there you go. Well, on that right. happy note. <laughs> yeah, we should uh, have some recommendations of things we like. Um, it's, yeah, instead of talking about all the magic that we don't like. <laughs> I have a recommendation. Good. Um, Jordan Peterson gave the commencement address oh. at my alma mater. Bless you, my child. Yeah, we are joined by Gretchen. <laughs> Who's Hello, very, Gretchen. very sleepy. Does, she, does Gretchen have She's a recommendation struggling. besides sleep? Her sneak. recommendation is um, her little penguin plushie lovey. Aww. She likes her little penguin. Um <laughs> Uh, but as I was saying, um, Jordan Peterson, the lobster king himself, uh, <laughs> gave the commencement address at Hillsdale College, um, and it's very worth listening to. Um, he talks about uh, the crossroads, which I think is an appropriate image to use for a commencement speech. Well, it's always a, a challenge with the commencement speakers 
at Hillsdale because often they're political figures. And so it's not really a commencement speech. It's like a political stump speech yeah. or, you know, somebody else wrote it and it's not very good. But, you know, when Jordan <laughs> Peterson goes to speak somewhere, I think he writes it himself and One it's would help. appropriate to the occasion. And so what's the he, basic theme? The basic theme is that every point in your life where you make a decision, you have the choice to choose the pursuit of Christ or the pursuit of destruction. And that's clearer at the weightier moments of decision. And, you know, I, I chose those words. Jordan Peterson didn't show. I was about to words. say, he said Christ. He, he actually did. Um, <laughs> so mm. he said, he keeps saying these things and I'm like, do you hear the words that you're saying? <laughs> but yeah, you know, there, there's always this challenge of, at Hillsdale, they talk about the good, the true, and the beautiful a lot. Yeah. And it's kind of like, oh, yeah. And of course, these are all united in Christ. It's like, no, all of these things came from Christ because yes. Christ is the embodiment of God, <laughs> you know? So I think reading his speech through that lens, it was extremely worthwhile. Mm. Um, and I don't know. I always like going back and watching the commencement ceremonies at Hillsdale because they're very sort of to the point. And it's not just sort of empty. It's like, here's why we're here. We have, we had a goal for these four years. You've accomplished something in those four, four, four years. Here's what it is. Good job. This is why we're going to keep doing what we're doing. Mm. And they were one of the few colleges who actually had a commencement in 2020 because they said, mm. hey, if this is ever worth doing, it's worth doing in a pandemic. Yeah. So they, they did it not to the scale that they normally do, but they did it, um, nice. you know, with health health safety precautions and all that. But anyway, yeah. yeah, it's on YouTube on the college's YouTube channel. Okay. Know. Brian, you got something? The best I have is just something I've, I've recommended multiple times before. And it's, it's, it's an anti-recommendation oh, no. in some sense. No, no, but we already also, anti-recommended magic. But we it's have to also recommend something good. a recommendation. Okay. Here's the thing. It's a it's a recommendation of something fun to do, but it's recommending you engage in something that is not necessarily good by terms of quality, which is watching bad movies and making fun of them. <laughs> um, I actually think you recommended this, but you could do it again. It's yeah, worth it. Yeah. I will absolutely how can, recommend it how again. How can you tell if they're bad movies, Brian? Uh, I mean, partially it's personal taste, but also it's um, by, by how well they adhere to the story its archetypes and uh, how, how much of it is reflected in the story you're watching. Uh, but also I think it, a, just a large amount, it does come down to taste. Um, I, I, I even think like the movie tremors with Kevin Bacon mm -hmm. is a perfect film. And I do not say that lightly. It is silly and campy and ridiculous, but its plot structure is just, chef's kiss it is perfect <laughs> like you get inciting moment and building and rising tension and there is a climax and there's denouement that makes sense and it's like it's so well structured i i i want to write an essay about it if i like could find the time um <laughs> but anyway yeah it comes down to taste it comes down to what is true and good and beautiful in it tie into your recommendation and he'll say so them. what is an example of a bad movie <laughs> oh do i ever have an example <laughs> um my wife and i recently watched through the twilight saga <laughs> oh no <laughs> no <laughs> and i will tell you it is painful it is extremely painful to watch through because there's like no pacing there's no real narrative flow there is no logic. And by gosh, we had so much fun making fun of that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not recommending those movies at all. But um, if for some reason you find yourself watching them, you can at least make the time redeemable by mocking it uh, in Elijah fashion. <laughs> yeah, this, is, this is a challenge because like, there are some things that are so awful that they are fun to watch and like mm -hmm. they present themselves as awful to you. It is self-evident that they are. Um, but then there's like things that could be fun to make fun of if you're with the right people. Oh yeah. And then there's things that are just bad and unpleasant to watch. Like, I don't know. I think for me, the librarians TV show 
falls into oh, this category yeah. where I it's just like I that. was here for knockoff Doctor Who, but then the main character ran off and we never see him again. And yeah, yeah, I can't. It doesn't work. I can't take it. I mean, yeah. that it's kind. Of, it's kind of the um, keeping with the Doctor Who analogy. Uh, it's the Sarah Jane Adventures. Oh, why are we here? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we watched Doctor Who for Doctor Who, and now we're stuck with one of his ex companions and school children. This doesn't work. Yeah. Ever watch Mystery Science City Theater? Uh, oh 3000? yes, absolutely. Yeah. If you want to find bad movies, there's a good place to go. <laughs> the, it's a whole uh, show of people and a robot. Are two robots and a, per- a person mocking movies? Some you of them are do it. so bad. Isn't mockery a human action? How did the robots pull that off? <laughs> um, who knows? Artificial intelligence. <laughs> um, it's crazy what they're doing with microchips these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, mine is. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make this recommendation with with qualifications, mostly because of the. It's it's kind of a downer. It's Russian literature, so therefore, get ah, ready. yeah. Uh, I'm going to recommend. But it's also beautiful and excellent and dark. Yeah, Crime and Punishment <laughs> oh, yes, by Fyodor right. Dostoevsky, which my kids are reading in school right now, and I'm reading it with them because it's been a long time, and I'm actually happy to make quiz questions. This is, um, that is just to interject. That is my favorite reading assignment from high school that I ever. Oh did. well, good, good. Uh, I think it is probably one of the best things we assign. But it takes, Mm -hmm. first of all, if you're not used to reading Russian literature, you need to print out a list of the characters with all of their multiple Russian (laughs) names. Yes. Because every Russian has three or four or five different names, and the author uses them with wild abandon without reminding you who this is. So Mm. you, you can get used to it, but initially it may be a bit confusing. It is, it's a novel. It's about, well, a particular crime and the punishment that follows Not primarily the civic punishment, which or judicial punishment, which waits at the end, and I won't tell you, I won't spoil the ending with what happens there. But a lot of it is just the psychological torture that the the killer goes through Mm. uh, as he is apprehending apprehension. (laughs) He's waiting to be found out, and 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 the the genius here. Uh, Dostoevsky had spent time in in the gulags with murderers. So he had talked to, interviewed murderers. Mm. Uh, not not cold-blooded serial murderers, but, you know, the guy who killed his girlfriend or his parlor maid or the butcher next door. Ordinary people who committed murder. And so he came to understand what the human mind does with that. And he brings it across in the lead character, whose mind we are in from the beginning. And so, because we're in the character's mind, we are tempted, without even realizing it, to empathize with the character and get to the point of, oh no, they're after him. Oh no, they're going to discover him. How is he going to escape without realizing, wait. He's the bad um, guy. He's the bad guy. I'm supposed to want him (laughs) to get caught. Are we the baddies? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. my my kids today in school, when I asked them a question, did you, did you notice this happening to you? And some of them said, no, no, not at all. Um, some said, well, for a minute. I don't know. What's, I haven't read all their essays yet. Usually I get, yes. And and what happened when you realized that you were doing this? Then I got really mad at the, at the writer. <laughs> Do you understand the writer knew that would happen? I guess. So in other words, he manipulated you to feel one thing and realizing that that would backfire and you would now be manipulated to feeling something else. So he's still manipulating you. Uh, Oh no. (laughs) Um, So it is a superb work work of literature on that point. My only stylistic objection is that nobody ever says anything. Everybody cries something. Uh, He cried this. She cried that. Translation issue. It may be. I don't know. Um, But the, the other thing, that's well two other things first it is a christian novel and i say that and people are going to read i'm going to ask my kids before too long why is this a christian novel they're going to say it's not (laughs) because we're in the mind of a murderer and (laughs) there is no clear conversion scene in the end there there's some discussion (laughs) of christ and the gospel but it's kind of comes you, you get at it tangentially and it's unclear and there's no resolution and you're left kind of wondering but the world you're in is a Christian world where sin and guilt are real things. And the conscience is a real thing. Yeah. And people are sinners. And nobody here is spotless. Everybody has their sins, his sins or her sins. 
Um, and so coming to terms with that is itself shut down a lot of your uh, works religion ideas. This is what this is. It's a religious book. These people are religious. They are not holy by any means. Uh, the, the, the last thing, and in some ways the most minor thing, is that it presents a different style of detection. There is a detective who shows up eventually. He's not particularly likable. Uh, but we see the murder committed. We follow everything through the eyes of the murder. And then eventually the detective comes on stage. And by using simple questioning and observation and psychological methods, he tries to get the, the protagonist to break and to confess himself without ever really coming out and saying, you did it. It just keeps creating these tense situations to get the character to talk too much and to admit mm -hmm. things he shouldn't admit until finally he's, the hope is he'll just spill everything and break down. In this respect, he is the prototype, this detective is the prototype for Columbo. And mm -hmm. if our listeners do not know who Columbo is, this is an age that knows not Columbo, go back uh, it's available on YouTube for free. At least certain episodes are. Uh, I forget what it's called. It's Columbo file or something like that with a PH. Um, and there's, you, you can get some of the older original uh, first runs. They are worth watching. Peter Falk is a, a marvelous actor. And the character he plays he created, the grandpa in Princess Bride. Yes, he does. That's maybe the only place some people know yeah, him from. I yeah, don't know. Yeah, that's that's the only place I'm, aside well, from Columbo. Yeah, and um, when uh, when Mary Allen joined the uh, the Sheriff's Explorers, they introduced her to a dog called McGruff, who wears a trench coat <laughs> and says, "Let's take a bite out of crime." And I had to explain this is a ripoff of Columbo. Who? Uh. <laughs> okay, we actually have the set, and I showed it to some of you before. Oh. Okay. I don't get it. Um, but anyway, there it, it's not a happy book, but it's a worthwhile book. So yep. that's my recommendation. Well, thank you both so much for this conversation. It's been a delight. Thank you also to our producer, David Maxson, our, my lovely witted husband. Thank you to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. Hope you've enjoyed the show. Uh, you should tell a friend about us if you did uh, and spread spread the joy. You can follow us on Facebook, on Rumble, on YouTube, anywhere you get your podcasts. We should be there. Let us know if we're not. Uh, if you would like to support us financially, you can do so at our website, which is anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. Thank you so much to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling, making sure we sound nice and smart by means of editing software. And new microphones. And new microphones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there we go. Have a great night. We'll see you next time. Wow, my brain's <laughs> sorry. You can follow us. You can yeah. You can donate. I'm gonna try this one more time. Third time's the charm, right? We believe in charms. Yes. <laughs> That's what we just talked about. I believe in magic. <laughs>